Dr Russell Norman. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I speak to rise on the first reading of the Regulatory Standards Bill, um, a bill put up by the ACT Party and um, apparently being voted on by the National Party. Um, this, this bill, or being voted for by the National Party, rather, this bill um, has so many things wrong with it, it's, it's kind of hard to know where to start. Um, so what I thought I'd do is I'd start in the, start in the middle and talk about um, the issue of takings, which I think is an, an interesting um, issue which this bill very much brings to the fore. Um, and one of the, so the way this bill works is that when a bill comes to Parliament, the Minister and the Chief Executive has to sign a piece of, have to sign a piece of paper that says uh, the bill meets these principles and if it doesn't then there's public interest in, in not meeting the principles. And then there's a set of the, the principles. Um, and I want to talk about one of those principles, which is uh, the issue with regard to takings and property. Um, what, basically what this says is that um, a piece of legislation can't take someone's property or impair someone's property unless it's in the public interest and that person or corporation is compensated um, in the process. And that's essentially what it says. So if we were to take some case studies to kind of flesh out what this would mean, um, I think it demonstrates the problem with this kind of approach to lawmaking. For example, if we were to talk about plain packaging of tobacco products. Now, um, if we were, as a, as a parliament or as a government, to introduce plain packaging of tobacco products, there would be certain tobacco companies that would argue that their property rights have been impaired as a result. Um, so as a result, so Philip Morris would come out and say, look, we used to be able to use our Marlborough brand and all the rest of it, but we can't anymore. So effectively, our property rights have been impaired. Now, if you think there's a public interest case to do that, so be it. But you have to compensate us if you are to follow the principles in this act, um, in this bill, rather. That would mean that the government, before it could move to introduce plain packaging of tobacco products, would be required to compensate Philip Morris for the entire impairment of their property rights, their intellectual property rights around their branding. Now, if this sounds vaguely familiar, the reason is, is that there's currently a case which Philip Morris is launching against Australia under a bilateral investment treaty between Australia and Hong Kong that uses exactly the same principles. Um, there it's termed, the term is expropriation or indirect expropriation, but it has exactly the same meaning. Now, <clears throat> my challenge to um, the Labor Party, actually, is, um, is that the Labor Party, while they were in government, signed a whole bunch of trade treaties that had exactly these same clauses in them um, that enable multinational companies to sue our government um, through bilateral investment treaties. That's in the China Free Trade Agreement. Um, there's the clauses within that. And there's a bunch of other um, bilateral investment treaties as well. Now, it seems to me that signing up to trade agreements or passing law that enables corporations to sue governments for their actions is a very, very bad idea. Because if we were, for public health reasons, to have plain packaging of tobacco, then I just think it's too bad for Philip Morris. I don't think that we should compensate Philip Morris for the fact that they would lose some money in the process. And I would say to the National Party, if you introduce this kind of law, um, then the onus would then be on the government that whenever we wanted to introduce a regulation which would impair someone's property right, we would be required to compensate them if we were to be consistent with the principles of this bill. And is that what you really want to do? Now, the answer, of course, is you know the answer to this question. The National Party doesn't want to do this because this isn't the first time this kind of legislation has come to Parliament. In fact, there was a bill that came to Parliament under the name of Gordon Copeland previously that did a similar kind of thing. At the time, the National Party minority view um, opposed it, and they said, and Chris Finlayson was the lead at that time, he said the amendment will have far-reaching implications and could well be the cause of a great deal of litigation against the Crown. Um, if we were to introduce this kind of principle. And what he meant was that if we introduce these kind of laws that say we can't pass a law without compensating someone whose property is impaired, then all of a sudden we could be sued by a whole bunch of corporations whenever we tried to pass legislation that they didn't like. And Chris Finlayson, or the, the members of the committee uh, from the National Party, went on to say compensation issues should not simply be left to the courts. There should always be a proper statutory basis for compensation. So it shouldn't be left to the courts in the process through the courts for, for corporations to sue the government or the parliament um, if we try to introduce rules. There are a bunch of other rules that we could talk about. Um, for example, um, <clears throat> if we were, for example, to talk about building standards. Now, building standards is a very um, relevant issue because New Zealand's just had the leaky houses crisis. 
One estimate is that the leaky houses crisis has cost our country $20 billion um, because of the, of the poor regulatory framework that was set up around the building industry. Now, the weak regulations around building have had to be strengthened in recent years as a result of the disaster of the leaky housing crisis. Now, there would be those who are involved in the industry who would argue that if we tried to strengthen their, the building standards and it meant that their, their products, for example, monolithic cladding, <laughs> Hardy, Hardy's comes to mind, um, couldn't be used or weren't going to be used as much because we'd strengthen the rules around building regulations, um, then they could sue us as a result of the impairment of their property. So Hardy's could say, look, you guys have just introduced new building regulations so that our monolithic cladding, which was one of the causes of the leaky housing disaster, not the only one, um, our monolithic cladding products just aren't going to be used anymore because everyone's going for weatherboard. Um, therefore, you have cost us an awful lot of money and we want compensation. And under the bill, this regulatory standards bill that Parliament's been silly enough to vote for, uh, we've got the right to sue you um, because we're suing you for compensation for the fact that you've closed up the, the rules around leaky houses. The reason why this is particularly apposite on this occasion, of course, is that the chair of the working group um, who put this, um, put this bill together, or at least the, the, the basis of this bill together, was none other than Graham Scott, who more than any other person in New Zealand is responsible for the leaky houses crisis. I like to call him our $20 billion man um, because he was, of course, Head of Treasury um, when all of this was pushed through the, the, the relaxation of the building standards. And Treasury was very active under Mr Scott for relaxing the standards around building. Um, it was, in fact, the, the ACT Party and Mr Scott who can be blamed for the leaky houses crisis, the $20 billion leaky houses crisis. If there could ever be an example of where regulations are important and necessary, the leaky houses disaster, I think, is probably the most obvious one. There are many others. Um, but that is one example where having good, strong regulations can be expensive up front because it means that the house a little bit more to build, but actually are in the long-term best interests of the country and especially the people that live in rotting houses and are having their life savings willed away because the ACT Party and the National Party weakened, or rather the National Party as it was then, weakened the standards around buildings um, back in 91 with their Building Act. And so having in, if we were to push this, uh, if this bill were actually to become law, then it would become difficult to tighten up the rules around building standards if we discovered that a mistake had been made which allowed a bunch of bad products and bad practices to result in a leaky housing disaster. Then if we wanted to tighten the rules, then those companies that lost money as a result, and some would, could rightly sue the government for compensation. So you can imagine the chilling effect that that would have on government if every time we wanted to fix up a regulatory problem, we had to compensate everyone who had lost property or had their property impaired as a result of that process. It would make it much more difficult. Think, for example, about um, environmental standards, another classic problem. Um, climate change. By introducing a carbon tax, there are winners and losers. Um, those people who have carbon-intensive products, as a result of a carbon tax, um, they will sell less of their product and their business is worth less. And they could rightly argue that their property had been impaired and therefore they could sue the government for compensation if we tried to restrict greenhouse emissions in New Zealand. Uh, so we would have to compensate. Every business would line up in the courts and seek compensation if these kind of principles were put in law. Mr Speaker, there's so much wrong with this bill, um, <clears throat> and I've focused just on one particular aspect. We could also talk about the way that the judiciary would be dragged into the policy process. We could talk about the way the neutrality of the civil service would be compromised because senior public servants would have to basically sign off on political processes. Um, we, could, we could talk about the fact that it won't even necessarily help business because it would make the process of lawmaking and regulation so much more difficult. But I think that it's worth thinking particularly around the property compensation issues because they have relevance not just for this bill but for the bilateral investment treaties that Labor and National are both very keen on. Thank you, Mr Speaker.